Life as a Neolithic farmer was one of great reward, but also of great risk. We have a fair deal of evidence and information on the life of Neolithic farmers, based on archaeological evidence from sites such as Karahuyuk, Stonehenge, Malta, and Kakao. Though the life of a Neolithic farmer varied and depended on location and the era, for many it was dangerous and uncertain. One bad harvest could doom an entire community, compared to others who almost had nearly annual perfect harvest. For the sake of this story, we will be looking at life in the Neolithic Levant. The Levant region is today the areas of western Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and some say the Sinai Peninsula. Currently, there are 5 million people in the entire world. Your name is Urbu, you are a Nutufian, and this is your day. The year is 10,000 BC, but to you, it's just another day. You are awoken by the morning light, beginning the morning with hearing your prehistoric, domesticated wolf barking at mice and wild aurochs, attempting to eat your recent wheat harvest, still drying in the field. Looking around at your mud dwelling and a thatched roof over the golden fields of wheat, neighboring hamlets, and slabs of stone, currently you are in one of Western Asia's biggest villages, with a total of 20 households, a staggering amount of people for 10,000 BC. You've heard rumors of a larger village to the south named Jericho, with even a mud brick tower, but for you that's far off. You're okay with your mud thatched roof and walls and a possible blanket as a door. Even in your small village life, you hold disdain for people of the wild, uncivilized hunter-gatherers. Though you're willing to trade with them, you fear them as they aren't tied down to one place, and they could easily raid your lands and run off, with you unable to capture them. Though you have no army to protect your lands, you have a dog. He'll bark if he sees anyone unknown. You get up and put on your hide tunic. It's the autumn season, so it's slightly colder than months previous. You think of the dream you had in the night. You saw three cattle grazing in one field, and three vultures in another. You do not know what this means, but you fear it could mean a potential drought. You ask the village shaman what it means later on. Your sister and her husband yell at you to go eat, and scold you for your clothing. Looking at your hide tunic, you look in shame tunic has holes all over, is covered in dirt, and is beginning to become discolored. Your friends and family will mock you for your ragged and unkempt appearance. Though you may not know about germs, bacteria, or disease, you're aware of what looking clean and well-kept is. Though you're grateful for the animal's life that you took to make your clothing, it's time for another. You can't walk around naked, though it's only 50 degrees Fahrenheit, it's still a little cold when the wind picks up. So in the following days, you'll be on the lookout for a potential animal to slaughter. As you begin to eat your breakfast of crushed wheat gruel, berries picked from a nearby forest, and little bits of meat left over from last night's dinner, your family tells you of their dreams they had last night, as they sow, tan hides, and offer prayers to your ancestors. Your brother is working on creating stone beads, for which he'll later sell for some date seeds. Your brother heard of delicious date fruit further south and wants to try growing them on your own farm. You tell him it'll be easier to create deity figures of the mother goddess or a large woman. In today's societies, we refer to these statues and figurines as Venus figurines. To you, it's an important part of your religion, people, and place in the world, though what that means has been lost to time. These figurines appear from Portugal, the Siberia, and down even in Egypt. But what exactly they represent is unknown. Unlike modern portrayals and common ideas of the Neolithic and prehistory in general, your best friend is not a mammoth. Your best friend is a semi-domesticated dog, still very reminiscent of a wolf. 
and your best friend, Ramush, another Nutufian in your village. Though you don't write down the words of your ancestors and you have no written language, you are able to recall past events of your tribe through songs, stories, and cave paintings. Interestingly, you've never once seen a mammoth. You've seen Syrian elephants. You've heard old songs and stories of these once massive monsters, but they're all gone. You can occasionally find some of their skeletons sticking out of the sand. In your world, they're lost monsters. You remember your mother and father as you helped grind the daily bread on a boulder outside. Though unlike the bread of today, it would be a lot more similar to non-bread and a lot less nutritious. With wheat only being recently domesticated and the kernels much smaller than they are today. You recently lost your parents, though they lived to the ripe old age of 40, fondly remembering them and honoring them by burying their bodies in the floor of your home to keep them close to yourself and your family, though your people and your culture will not begin plastering and decorating the skulls until millennia in the future. Following your breakfast, you harvest the remaining wheat in the field with a sickle made of obsidian blades and a jawbone, a perfect tool. Thanking the spirits and the ancestors for this successful harvest, as you've heard of neighboring tribes getting less rainfall and having serious famine. This was a time before irrigation. All of your crops are either fed by rain or by being a nearby spring or along a waterway. Moving the wheat into stone towers covered in plaster to keep out the rodents. You also throw in some thorny bushes and extra protection against rodents. You hurry up and finish your chores, for today is an important day. Your friend Ramush has asked you to come on the hunt for wild auroch. Though aurochs have been domesticated into cattle, some wild aurochs still roam the countryside. Occasionally trampling a farmer's field, crashing through a person's home, or even goring someone. You gather your bow and arrow, your spear, and your dagger along with a few berries putting them into a woven bag to carry. Before you go, you forgot your sandals. You go back to your home and pull out a pair of woven reed sandals. It might be a bit uncomfortable, but it's better than walking barefoot. You and your friends set off walking into the nearby hills. Sharing the berries of your friends and eating them, you walk over a high cliff and see an auroch grazing below. Your friend decides to shoot the auroch with his bow, hitting it in the leg. As you try to shoot it but miss, running down the sides of the cliff, you fling your arrow at the auroch. Missing again, you and your friend laugh as you pick up the spear and arrows, but the auroch runs away. Passing nearby caves with handprints from a far past, as the various animals of the past reflect out of the cave wall. Going back to your hamlet, you gather some firewood and begin building a fire, rubbing sticks together to create embers. After building the fire, you cook up some field mice you caught walking home and skewer them into the fire. They'll make a nice treat as a replacement for the auroch. On the way back to your home, you see the village shaman who asks him what the dream meant. He tells you that the vultures represent neighboring tribes and the cattle represents you. He warns that neighboring tribes are having failed harvest and that they might become aggressive and desperate if things get worse for them. Times are changing, though to you, they are the same as always. While violence and warfare aren't as common as they'll become in the future, 
you occasionally attack neighboring tribes in revenge for previous killings, insults, or for raiding. You're worried that if the drought gets too terrible, their desperation may overwhelm you and your village. You gather some herbs and charcoal, rubbing them on your teeth after eating the mice. Your teeth have become increasingly sensitive and worn down. You don't know it yet, but your teeth are being worn down from constantly eating stone ground foods, which will leave little bits of stone in your teeth. The herbs and the charcoal soothe the sensitivity, and you wash down the taste of water from your cistern. Unfortunately, beer hasn't been created yet, at least not in the Levant region. For recreational narcotics, your options consist of local plants, consisting of harmal, which is similar to ayahuasca, wild lettuce sap, which acts as a pain reliever, sage, skullcap flowers, and valerian flowers. Although you weren't able to find any of these plants today. You're constantly undernourished. Unlike your hunter-gatherer neighbors, further north or to the east, you eat a diet composed mostly of cereal grains with some vegetables and wild game. Though you'll get enough to eat, it nutritionally is an unbalanced diet, being made mostly of carbohydrates. You'll eventually get arthritis from the constant grinding of cereals, the back-breaking labor of being a farmer, and your poor diet. For that's not to worry, when you get old and infirm, your children would take care of you, the same way you took care of your parents. Your stomach is hurting, so you lie down, asking your family for assistance. They offer prayers and religious totems. You don't know this now, but you got a stomach bug from drinking contaminated water. It's likely an animal fell into your water cistern and contaminated it. You decide to sleep it off and go back to your bed of straw and hides. You wake up later in the afternoon, it's time for dinner, and since you weren't feeling well, your family gives you a bowl of grounded up wheat with a little honey, hopefully to soothe your stomach. Well, they eat bread and a rabbit, caught earlier in the day. You eat your meal in your wooden bowl, eating with your hands. You decide to go to sleep, hopefully that will make you feel better. Tomorrow in the morning, you'll set up some stone to carve. You're hoping to make beautiful vessels to store olives and seeds in for the winter. You fall asleep to the sounds of your family playing drums and flutes around the fire, later telling stories of your ancestors and the history of your people. You gaze out into the night sky with the few small holes in your roof, seeing all the stars and the stories they hold for your people. The animals you face in your normal day are different to someone in Alaska, Papua New Guinea, and Italy. Though an aurochs is a very dangerous game animal, it won't hunt someone down as a saber-toothed tiger would. This is just one day in the life. Every day was the same, but different for varying people. Some died days after being born, others living after 50 years, an unimaginable amount of time for the period. The Neolithic era is one of humankind's most fascinating and innovative eras, with agriculture, animal husbandry, and permanent settlements being established. The age of the Neolithic is generally regarded to have been between 12,000 to 5,000 BC. However, the consensus for the Neolithic is the advent of agriculture and animal husbandry along with pottery. Thus, the Neolithic era varies depending on which location is being discussed. For instance, the Neolithic lasted until 2000 BC in Scandinavia, and for some areas in the world such as Papua New Guinea, the Neolithic began 12,000 years ago. The Neolithic era is generally believed to end when metallurgy began in their respective places. However, when it came to the Americas, Papua New Guinea, the end of the Neolithic is much more vague. How exactly the advent of agriculture began is unknown. There are varying theories with the most popular one being that plants grew out of people's rubbish piles. And people learned that they could control the growth of these plants. For your person, Urbu, it's as if these plants grow by magic. And he was taught how to grow crops by his father and their forefathers. Life in the Neolithic was very tenuous. One bad harvest could easily wipe out an entire settlement. 
Wild animals such as lions, elephants, and wolves roamed the land, with each being dangerous on their own. Disease was common, and there were few natural cures. War wasn't as common. However, that doesn't mean your neighbors aren't eyeing your harvest. Though for as hard as your life was in the Neolithic era, there was also a great flourishing in art and music. There were plenty of ways to keep you entertained. You could create clothing, go hunt, go create cave art, create a sculpture, play the play drums, them. play a flute, or just relax in the sun. Of course, you were never alone in any of this. Your family is always close by, whether alive or dead. Thank you for watching.